good morning and um, welcome to God Day. I hope that you are having a good start to your day. Um, wherever you are, that you are knowing God's blessing. Even if you are in time of difficulty, it is still possible to know God's blessing. That is to know um, His joy even in times of struggle. These are challenging days and these are days of great trial, um, but what a wonderful reminder we have in Jesus Christ that we are, are looking forward to something that is not of this world. We're looking forward to uh, that joy that awaits in the new heaven and new earth where there's only justice and righteousness. Let's pray before we dive into God's Word. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would enlighten us, enliven us, encourage us, inspire us, enable us to have that power and ability from your Holy Spirit to live as you have called us. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 where in verse 1 we read, Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As He has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day, today saying through David so long afterwards in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account." Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need." We have a very clear call in this passage, a clear call that resonates throughout this entire letter to the Hebrews. What's clear about this letter is that it seems to be written to people who are very, very familiar with the Old Covenant. They're very familiar with the Old Law. Many have put forward that it's, it's likely that this letter was written primarily, maybe even exclusively, to those who are um, Hebrew followers of Jesus, primarily um, Jewish background believers. Uh, it could very well be that many of these were also God-fearing Gentiles who we see referred to regularly in the New Testament, who though not of Jewish background and culture were worshipers and followers of Yahweh, very clear on the teaching of the Old Covenant and in previous days, maybe even at that time, regular members of the synagogue as so many of the early visitors, uh, as so many of the early uh, individuals in the church were. What is very clear is that there seems to be some uh, level of maybe confusion or a level of risk, a level of temptation to take on board certain tendencies and certain viewpoints that are out of sync with the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. Throughout Hebrews, there's one word that is mentioned again and again, uh, and that word is better. 
and it relates almost always to how Jesus is better than something else. Jesus is better than, chapter 1 tells us, the angels. And Jesus is better and provides a, a more sure revelation, is the implication very strongly, um, than the, the prophets. He is the one who in these last days um, has re revealed to us God's plan and purpose. He is not just a created being. He is not just an angel. He is certainly not just a human being. He took on human flesh. Uh, he was with us. He was like us. And He was for us before the Father, our Father, Creator in heaven. Uh, he's better than Moses. He's better than uh, the high priest. He's better than the sacrifices that the high priest in the Old Testament offered. He himself is uh, considered by Hebrews as our great high priest who enables us to once and for all time have access to God once more in right relationship with Him, whether we're Jew or non-Jew, Gentile. In this chapter, we have a very clear call to act, a call that's urgent, a call to act now. And it's the call that extends to you and me, yes indeed, if we are in Christ right here and right now, to step into that heavenly calling that's ours, that we may not have fully come to terms with or fully realized as followers of Jesus, but also for those who are perhaps as of yet seeking or who are, are as of yet not yet believers, a call to enter into the rest of God. God has promised rest. That's where we see in verse 1 of this chapter of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, reminds us of that reality that God has promised rest. We should be concerned most with whether we have reached His rest. That's the implication of this whole chapter. God has promised rest. You should be concerned and should be asking whether or not you've entered that rest. He says, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, just as to the Hebrews of the past. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Speaking of those who fell and perished in the wilderness following the Exodus, they had heard the same message. They were part of the same covenant community of Hebrews. They were led by the same deliverer appointed by God, Moses. They were able to partake in the same food. They had and received the same manna. They uh, were able to drink of the same streams of God's provision there in the wilderness. But ultimately, the only ones who survived the wilderness warnings were those who listened and obeyed Joshua and Caleb. They were the only ones who survived the wilderness warning, uh, uh, the wilderness roaming, the wandering that happened for 40 years uh, following the initial entry into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb had listened to God. They had listened to God's promises and had seen Him work in dramatic, powerful ways. So when they arrived at the promised land, they said, God will give us this land. Let's go and take it. Um, but there were others who reported back to the congregation, the assembly of the released Hebrews as a whole, saying that it was too difficult. There were giants in the land, is how they put it, and they felt like grasshoppers who would be destroyed under those giants' feet. Well, as it transpires, uh, those individuals would be consigned to 40 years of wandering around in the wastelands of the desert, dissatisfied, unhappy, and unable to enter into that promised land, that promised land of rest that God had spoken of. Even Moses himself was not going to enter into the promised land, but would only see it from a, a distance. He's speaking here, though, not so much of the physical rest that and those individuals uh, were to enter. He's not speaking of a physical promised land as such, but he's saying there's a greater spiritual rest that that promised land points to that you and I should be very concerned about whether or not we have access to. Uh, that's why this letter is being written to, to, to stir these individuals up saying, look, you, you can be a part of the, the community in some way, but not be legitimately resting in God. 
You can profess to be a part of God's people, but if you are not right with Jesus, if you are not focusing your eyes on Jesus, if you are not stepping into His rest, you will not have that rest. Just because you are a Christian in name does not make you Christian in nature. Just because you are, are culturally or ethnically or familiarly associated with the promises of God in some way does not make you a part of God's covenant community that will enjoy the new heavens and new earth of righteousness. And this is where so often there's a mix-up. Many times we look at this and we, we assume that this implicates or indicates in some way that we will or can lose that right relationship with God, that somehow having been born again, we can become unborn again. That's not possible. Jesus Himself said that no one takes those who are given to Him out of the Father's hand. It, those who uh, are in Christ truly, nothing can separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from that love. But there are many who profess Christ who do not possess Christ. There are many who um, that they will proclaim in some way that they know Jesus, but on the day of judgment He'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. They are in name a part of the Christian community, but by nature they are not recognized by God as having the Holy Spirit. God has promised rest, and you and I should be concerned that we uh, have access to it and that we will enter that rest. The, the beautiful reality is, in addition to God's promise, um, is, is that God is patient with us. He says, therefore, since it remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Uh, God said a certain day, he goes on to say, calling it today. Uh, this he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. God is patient with us and enables us uh, to have that time um, to enter His rest. It remains for us, some of us, to enter it. Um, but th there's that option. He has appointed a certain day and He calls us today to consider, today to enter that rest. So what we have here in Hebrews chapter 4 really is a call to act and a call to act now. A call to hear the claims and the promises of Jesus Christ and to act upon that that we have heard. He is patient with us and as such continues to extend this call. The, the promise of entering His rest still stands. He has not cut it off. If you are listening to this right now, today the message is for you, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. In verse 8, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did uh, from his. It's Jesus Christ who enables us. Jesus, the Son of God, who he speaks of in verse 14, is the one who has acted on our behalf as a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, who enables us to hold fast our confession, who sympathizes with us in our weakness. He is patient and kind, who in every respect was tempted as we are but without sin. So on that basis with confidence, let's go near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is such patience that God has with us, and yet there is an urgency uh, to this situation where we, we, we need to actually be right now um, assessing whether or not we are in God's rest. There's a call to act now. God is patient with us, but we, we should not look at that patience and keep um, pushing away God's promises. We should look at that patience and actively contend against the barriers to that rest. He says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. How you behave reflects what you believe. If you disobey God's Word, it shows how you consider God's Word. If you disobey God's Word, 
I, I, and, and this is a, a life-defining and ongoing issue and problem, uh, then it, it shows that you're not taking God's call seriously. It shows that you have not entered into His rest. Earthly promises, however great and full, do not give the rest that we need. The promised land was there, but it did not even give the, uh, the rest that the people were looking for. It's, it's very clear throughout Hebrews that Moses could not lead people, not only to that initial promised land, but he could not give people what they ultimately needed. He could not give the Hebrews that ultimate rest that God promises. And the same Joshua, Joshua was used by God to do great things and he obeyed God and he had faith in God. It was counted to him as righteousness as it was so many others. Uh, but if Joshua had given them the rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So what is this rest that is promised? What is this rest that we need now? God gives us earthly promises and they are great and, and they are full, but they do not give us that ultimate rest that we so desperately need. There's a greater promised land, a better promised land than the promised land of uh, the, the physical land of Israel. There's something that goes beyond that. Earthly politics, however pure, cannot give the rest uh, that we need, that Jesus gives. Joshua uh, was called by God to lead the people. Uh, Joshua was uh, called by God to um, take the people into the promised land. And there was a, a political element to that, doubtless. He was a leader. He was one who uh, had control and responsibility and accountability over a range of others who were there to judge and govern and help um, God's people along, who, who was there for an uh, administration to divide up the land once they had conquered it. Um, but However pure we could look at some of those politics in, in, in Scripture, some of those characters in um, authority there, people like Joshua, Joshua could not be the king that the people so desperately needed. Another Yehoshua was needed, another Joshua was needed, and he is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ who saves us from our sins. I was one time wandering through um, the city of London and there was a protest massive protest and there was um, a child who was carrying a placard that said, save my world, save my future. And you, you can look at that and there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we could unpack there, but uh, the reality is we can do our utmost and we can expend all of our effort and resources and see um, a measure of this world receiving comfort or salvation, but it still would not enter into that ultimate salvation and that ultimate rest uh, that we most desperately need that should be our priority. The scriptures call us to have nothing to do with the unfruitful actions that darkness produces, but to instead expose them for what they are. And so often in our world we recognize that there is no pure politic. There is only corruption. There is, um, if we might feel that's a bit of an overstretch, we can at least say there's often corruption. But everything in our lives, everything in this world around us is corrupt to some degree. Everything in our experience is um, corrupt even if by nature of it's being corruptible. It is something that can be impacted and something that um, is impacted by sin and its consequences which features guilt, shame, uh, pain, sorrow, grief, discomfort. All of these things are impacted by uh, the, the sin problem in this world. So earthly promises we can be distracted by and they can uh, distract us from entering that rest. Earthly politics we can and should be involved in to some degree, I believe. But we cannot allow these things to uh, interfere with our pursuit of that ultimate rest. Earthly pleasures Sin's technicolor dream coat tantalizes and titillates and begs us to come over and join in its rebellion. Our basic instinct is to run with eyes wide shut into the risky business of sin's true crimes against our Creator, um, wherein we, we ourselves are constantly 
um, just even maybe witlessly in some cases, going against him, not entering that rest that he promises, pursuing our own ends and purposes. God is pure and we are not. This is uh, another thing that we have to realize. God has promised rest. God is patient with us and enables us and calls us to actively contend against the barriers to that, re to that rest. Uh, God is pure and knows that we are not. We see here um, in Hebrews 4 that, uh, that, that God himself has given a particular day, a, a day um, that we should enter his rest. Today, he says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Elsewhere, we read that uh, God Himself in verse 12, uh, that His Word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, who is the Son of God, we should confess that while we are not pure, our high priest is. And so, because we have this high priest who is acting on our behalf, we are right with God. And we should hold fast that confession. We should continue to cling to that reality. We know that we have not entered into that rest fully. Uh, we know that, that we are expectant of something else, but um, there's a sense through which Jesus Christ, acting as our high priest, uh, has brought us to something that is already but not yet. He's brought us into th this place of acknowledging and knowing and being assured of and having confidence in this hope that we will enter into that full and final rest that is God's salvation, that is that promised land of eternity, that is uh, a place of purity and righteousness. We confess openly, we are not pure. We have sinned. We have disobeyed, even as those Hebrews did in the wilderness. But we are the people of God who have trusted Him fully and have been united in looking to Jesus as our Savior, recognizing that no earthly promises, politics, or pleasures can provide what Jesus Himself only is able to fully provide. Uh, the promises He gives are greater and better than the promises the earth presents. Uh, the politics that He brings are more successful and more accurate. Um, and His reign is from everlasting to everlasting as Lord of heaven and earth. His pleasures uh, that He presents to us, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places right now if we are in Jesus Christ and we await worshiping Him in a new heaven and new earth of righteousness for eternity. Th this is something that we hold fast to as part of our confession, confessing that while we are not pure, our high priest, Jesus Christ, the righteous, is, we confess Him, and so we become partakers of His righteousness because of that faith. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this he is bound to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. In the days of his flesh, verse 7 of chapter 5 says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. We see very clearly that Jesus is the one who is able to make us right with God through that sacrifice he gives. God's peace is given to all who come to him in Christ Jesus. Your confidence in this life and your confidence in the next is built on this truth, on this reality. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace on this basis, with confidence, with full assurance of faith, with that hope. Let us approach God's throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find that grace to help us in our time and need. He is our priest. We profess him as our Savior and Lord, as our great high priest. And we declare that he is our peace. The individuals who died in the wilderness died in the wilderness because they disbelieved God. They did not act in faith. They did not trust His promises. They were looking forward to the promised land, but uh, they, they wanted to achieve the promised land without any sacrifice, without any difficulty, without any effort, without any real display of confidence and faith. You and I are called to step forward, um, to answer the call that we have to act now. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't say tomorrow. Don't keep looking into the distance. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll keep considering and arrive. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Enter into His rest with full confidence, even right now. Go before the throne of God's grace. Cry out to Him in faith. Profess Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And you can know that He is your great high priest who gives Himself up to uh, make reconciliation between you and God and to bring that everlasting peace that we so desperately need. Through that, we can already enter His rest right here and right now. We can enter that Sabbath rest, which is Jesus Christ, who is declared to be our Sabbath. It's not a set day. It is that Jesus is our Sabbath. And you and I can look forward to that everlasting Sabbath, that everlasting rest and peace that we have with Jesus, our Savior and Lord. This is a call to act. It's a call to act now. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart.